The Prepper Podcast, Episode 7. The American people would never vote for socialism. He said under the name of liberalism, the American people will adapt every fragment of the socialist program. The Prepper Podcast is an up-to-date survival podcast based on military, wilderness, and modern-day survival, and may be found at thepreparpodcast.com. I am Ken Jetson, and this is the podcast about everything survival. This is Episode 7, and I'm going to discuss different methods of finding north with and without a compass or GPS. Today's episode can be found at thepreparpodcast.com slash 007. Hey there, everybody. I am back one more week. Um, I just wanted to, you know, kind of call an action out for you guys. I needed to give you a call to action, so to speak. I I wanted you to uh, head on over to iTunes and give me a review. If you believe I deserve it, go ahead and give me a five-star review and uh, give me a comment. Because five-star reviews and comments, they... um, they actually make your podcast more visible. I've made it easy for you. If you can remember theprepperpodcast.com, then you can go to theprepperpodcast.com slash iTunes, and it'll redirect you straight there. Once you get there, you know you can figure out what to do. All right, so uh, let's get started. You're going to want to know how to, you know, if you're in the into camping and hiking and stuff like that, or or if you're just the type of person that likes to listen to this style of podcast and uh, you want to find your way out of a bad situation, um, it's always good to uh, be able to you know know where you're going to go, where you're at um, with the uh, earthly coordinates, north, east, south, and west. So. Um, really in survival, there is, uh, one basic rule that you need to know first, and that's know where you are relative to where you want to go. And that means if you're heading out anywhere, it's a good idea to know where it is on a map relative to a large interstate, to your home, things like that. Um, If you are in a scenario um, and you are the type of person that prepares to to be in a scenario where you don't want to be found by people, well then you know which directions to go to stay away from people. So it's very important to know north, east, south, and west, how to find those, where you're at, and where you are heading to. And another point, do not, I repeat, do freaking not trust your direction to ant hills, moss on trees, tree branches, or melting snow. Alright, this crap may be true 75% of the time, but you have to think about this. Ants are going to build how ants want to build. Moss is going to grow any time that there is a microclimate that will allow it to grow, not just because of the direction of the sun. Everybody tells you, oh, well, you're in the northern hemisphere. Moss grows on the north side of a tree. Well, that's not necessarily true. At work every single day, I take a look down, and I see moss on the southern side of buildings and stuff like that. What it is is it has to do with the shade and the and the microclimate of that area that makes it good for moss to grow. So, in woods, there's a very good chance that moss can grow in all directions. There may be a little more to the north, and you may use that as a little bit of guidance to use another method 
but do not trust your direction to them. You could die in that situation. Don't worry about tree branches following, you know, going in the direction of sun. Don't worry about melting snow because once again, like I said, microclimates. Just because the snow is not melted there does not mean that the sun doesn't reach there. It doesn't mean that the sun's not in that direction. Something may be in the way. Don't do something stupid and kill yourself. You need to learn the more accurate ways of finding your bearings. This is especially true when you're lacking experience. The more knowledge you have and the more you practice with it, the better equipped you are if you need to find your way back to civilization or escape it. So, let's get started on the better methods of finding your bearings. The very first thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, my GPS. I actually really like the Garmin Dakota 20. Um, there is another one, I think it's called the Colorado. Uh, don't quote me on that, just look up Garmin, go to Garmin's website and you can figure that out. But mine is the Garmin Dakota 20. I like that GPS. It's a nice touch screen one. It, um, it's water resistant, uh, weatherproof. It's just really nice. It's easy to see. Uh, it's got backlighting on it. And the batteries last for quite a long time for what it is. Um, they can tell you the direction of tra GPSs can tell you the direction of travel, the distance traveled, elevation, barometric pressure, um, and can plot your traveling history, which can help you track back to where you were if that's what you needed to do. The barometric pressure, um, that's really good for like storm, um, guessing when a storm's going to hit, stuff like that, because you'll see the barometric pressure drop when that happens. So here's the deal. I tell people always take a GPS and a compass and map with them. You may be able to find your way out using the sun, using sticks, using all kinds of different methods, using the stars. But, like I've told many people in my blog, if you have to rely on those methods, you've already failed in some aspect. So, you need to be prepared for the worst thing to happen, but you need to... Do whatever you can so that that thing doesn't happen. In other words, prepare for things that you may have to rely on, but also prepare so that you don't have to rely on those. So the GPS is very accurate, and it can plot where you've been on a map, which makes it very easy to use. Lots of cell phones have GPS now. But we all know that cell phone batteries do not last very long. So I still uh, would say get a dedicated GPS. Now if you're doing something like geocaching, you can use your cell phone, compass, and everything else for the geocaching, and that's fine. But you should always have some other method. Next is using a compass. The compass points to magnetic north, not true north. So when you're using a compass, it's very important that you um, adjust the bezel ring based on your map. Uh, I have done a video on this, and I'll, um, if I remember to, at the end of this, I will attach the um, video uh, in the show notes today. And the show notes, once again, theprepperpodcast.com slash 007. I will add that video so that you guys can uh, kind of get an uh, a better idea of how to do this because there's only so much that I can explain to you over audio. But learn to use the map and the compass. And uh, what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to match up true north with magnetic north, and you're going to do that with your bezel ring. That may be the wrong way to say it, but that's the way I've been saying it for some time now. So it's the bezel ring. 
and you're going to rotate that and in order to line up the north on your bezel ring with where your needle is pointing. So you sit your map down on the table. The arrow of your, your direction of travel arrow, go ahead and point that to the north on your map. And you take your bezel ring and you rotate that until the arrow, the orienting arrow, is pointing to the north. Okay? That will help you line up your compass so that you can um, you can use it better on a map. And once you map out your direction, then you will be able to use your compass pointing in the direction that you're walking. You can use landmarks that your uh, direction arrow is pointing to and then walk to those landmarks. When using a compass, go ahead and choose landmarks that are far away, as far as you can see, and a landmark that's easy to see and that you won't forget, uh, because what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to look down at the compass and you're going to trip and fall all the time if you're looking down at the compass. And if you just look in the direction of the compass, put the compass in your pocket, and then walk, you're going to walk in circles. It's been proven that people will walk in circles um, if given the opportunity. So what happened, what, what you're supposed to do is use it to find a landmark and follow that landmark. Go in the direction of the landmark, and when you get to it, then you can use your compass again. You can also use that landmark to line up to another landmark, but it's best to use your compass again if you have it. All right, that's going to be enough on the compass. If you want more detailed um, instructions on how to use one to uh, orient your map and and figure out which direction to travel to go, um, just check out the video. I'll put it on there. All right, and the next is going to be um, your GPS batteries have failed. You were an idiot and you forgot to bring your compass. So now what do we do? We can, if we're... Um, traveling at night or if we just want to use um, if we want to find a landmark at night or something we can use the North Star everybody the North Star is probably the most accurate thing that we have in nature it um, I think it's only a, a degree or two off which is definitely close enough for most of us to get where we're going um, to to some degree to get where we can actually see um, to where we can recognize and then find out where to go from there. Um, a couple of degrees can get you quite a ways away from where you exactly want to go, but it should get you close enough to where you can recognize your area. So we use the North Star. The North Star is the very last star in the tail of the Little Dipper. All right, and the North Star does not move very much. The rest of the sky essentially rotates around the North Star. So I use the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia as, uh, as my locating uh, devices for the North Star. A lot of times the Little Dipper is really hard to see, so you can always, almost always find the Big Dipper, and if the Big Dipper is not available, then you can find Cassiopeia, because the Big Dipper may be behind trees or something. All right, so the Big Dipper, if you look at the big spoon portion of the Big Dipper, not the handle, but the spoon, there's two stars making up the front of the Big Dipper. You draw an imaginary line uh, through those stars and keep continuing on um, in the direction of the Big Dipper opening, so to speak, like the spoon opening, uh, not the bottom of the spoon, but the top of the spoon. So you draw a line on the two, um, the two stars that make up the end of the Big Dipper. That line will point to the North Star. Now about, I don't know, um, 140 degrees away from that is Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia looks kind of like an M or a W. And the middle star of Cassiopeia 
almost point like the um, the middle of the M or the middle of the W almost points to the North Star. All right, it's not exactly straight uh, from Cassiopeia, but it's pretty close. And it's, it's essentially halfway between the center of Cassiopeia and the end of the Big Dipper, the spoon side of the Big Dipper. All right, um, I also am going to have a link to a blog post that I've done on this that has um, more things that you can look at and kind of get a visual on what I'm talking about here. Once again, like I said, there's only so much that you can do through audio. I provide this audio so that uh, people that just can't use screen time uh, can get some idea of things that they need to do. So the idea behind today is now you know the different ways that you can find north. Now it's time for you to research and practice them. My children and I use the North Star quite often when we're camping. I actually uh, teach them over and over again. Um, but one thing that I have never used is the Southern Cross. I don't have extensive knowledge in the Southern Cross method, so I'm just going to explain to you the best that I can. Um, there's a South Pole. It's called the Celestial South Pole. And uh, you're not going to find some star or something there. But you will find the Southern Cross. And then there is a uh, star called uh, Ak Akinar. I believe I'm saying it. That, uh, that's the correct way of saying it. Achinar or Akinar. Um, the South Celestial Pole is halfway between the Southern Cross and Akinar. And then it's also, if you find what's called the pointer stars, they're really close to the southern star, and they're approximately the same width as the southern star. And then you go down the length of the southern star to the bottom, and you make an imaginary line all the way to Akinar, and then you take your pointers, the pointer stars, below, well, it actually depends on the time of night, but your pointer stars somewhere close to the southern star, and you go exactly perpendicular to those, you will draw an imaginary line exactly perpendicular to those and intersect the line that the Southern Cross makes with Akinar and where those two imaginary lines intersect will be your South Celestial Pole. Like I said, I've never used this method. I'm just telling you this method because I have people that actually listen to my podcast that are not in the United States. Some of those people may be able to use the Southern Cross method. Once again, these photos will be on my blog. My blog link will be on the show notes. The next piece of technology that I trust a lot more than uh, GPS is... Um, a dial watch. It's always good to have yourself a dial watch. Um, you have to use this on a sunny day or at least uh, sunny enough for you to know where the sun is. Here's the deal. You have the dial hand uh, watch on your wrist. You hold the wrist up in front of you where the dial watch is level to the ground. You point the hour hand of the dial watch at the sun. Then you will intersect between the sun and noon. All right, you, you look at the 12 o'clock position. The line intersecting between the sun and the 12 o'clock position will be north and south line. The, um, let's see. The more acute angle for those mathematicians that listen, the uh, smaller angle will be pointing toward the south. The very large angle or the point that is made um, where the watch hands meet, the point there that is made by your imaginary um, two arrows will be making the north. So your hour hand goes to the sun. The other imaginary line goes to the 12 o'clock position. And in between those two is south. And then opposite of south is north. 
if you are on daylight savings time, you use 1 o'clock instead of 12 o'clock. So you point your hour hand at the sun, and your other imaginary line will be at 1 o'clock. And then you will use the imaginary north-south line that you get from this. If you are in the southern hemisphere, it's still pretty much the same idea, except you will point 12 o'clock to the sun, and you will use the hour hand as another imaginary line. And then you will find your north-south line in between once again. So in the north, you point your hour hand to the sun. In the south, you point 12 o'clock to the sun. All right, that should be enough of the watch method, but you have to use a dial watch. You can't use a digital watch. That is why every survivalist um, or every wilderness person should use a dial watch in the wilderness, not a digital one. All right, so the watch was actually designed after a sundial, um, you know, and here is another method that is essentially using the uh, physics behind a sundial to uh, find your um, north, south, east, and west again. You can use a stick in the ground and actually find your east-west line. You will put the stick in the ground, let's say about a three-foot tall stick. Let's make it broad enough so that it's easy to see on the carpeting, which is the ground. All right, um, you will put a, a rock at the very tip of your stick shadow. You put a rock on the ground. Go ahead and wait 15 to 20 minutes. If you wait a little bit longer, it is more accurate. So wait. 15 to 20 minutes, you put your second rock on the ground at the tip of where the new shadow is. The line between the rocks is your east-west line. The first rock will be west. The second rock will be east. It doesn't matter if you're in the north or the south. Your first rock will be west. Your second rock will be east. So, if you know never eat soggy waffles or never eat shredded wheat, then you can do northeast, southwest. All right, that if you're in the northern hemisphere, you put your left hand on the west rock, you put your right hand on the east rock, and you look right in front of you. You're looking north. In the southern hemisphere, I would say you are... Still looking north. All right, let's go to the next method. I guess I never told you guys that I actually teach uh, my kids that stick method quite often. Uh, here's another method that I've tried to teach my kids quite a bit is the crescent moon. Now, this works best with the crescent moon, but if you have something that's larger than a half moon, you can still use it. You've just got to use your imagination. Let's just do it with the crescent moon, and you guys can figure out the rest from there as you get familiar with it. It is said that you take the crescent moon tips, um, the top part to the bottom part, and you draw an imaginary arrow to the ground. And we're talking about the northern hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's quite the opposite. You're going to find north with this method, but in the northern hemisphere, we're going to find south. Imaginary line between the two tips. Make the imaginary line go all the way to the, to the earth. Where that imaginary line goes is supposed to be south. I find this method a little more difficult to do. The reason why I find this method more difficult to do is because you have a lot of sky space. And lines are not very um, easy to use in a sky space that is round. The earth is not flat. So our straight lines don't really work too well when you're pointing it in the southern direction. You're going to be off. So what I find a lot easier is if the moon is high in the sky and we are um, close to the horizon with it, 
that imaginary line that I told you to draw to find north or south is now a bowstring. When you pull that bowstring back, your arrow is going completely perpendicular to that bowstring. That bowstring is pointing to east or west. So that that's really the best way that I know to do it if uh, the moon is close to the horizon in either direction. Um, if you are well after midnight, it is typically going to be pointing west if you're looking at this. And if you are well before midnight, sorry, after midnight, it's going to be pointing east. Don't let me get you killed. Um, but if you're looking at it, you know, well before midnight, it, the arrow is probably going to be pointing west. All right. So next is a pretty cool one. And this is one that you learn in the Boy Scouts. And it is a compass from a needle on a leaf. All right. So the compass needle on a leaf. First, we have to have a leaf and we have to have water and we have to have a needle. Those aren't the only tools that we need to have. We have to have either a magnet or silk or wool. It has to be these natural fibers, silk or wool. All right, so what you'll do is you will take your needle and you will rub it in one direction. You won't rub it back and forth. You will rub it in one direction with a magnet. If you do this 10 to 20 times, you will magnetize it if you're using a magnet. If you do this about 100 times, with silk or wool, you will get it to magnetize with the silk and wool. And the tip of the needle will point north when you get done with this. Um, well, that's assuming that you make a compass out of it. Uh, I just told you how to magnetize it. I didn't tell you how to make a compass yet. So if you find a small area of water, then you find a leaf that will float on that area of water, and you put your needle on top of that leaf. Because water has low resistance to the leaf movement, the leaf and the needle will move till the needle points north. Keep in mind where you placed it in the water at and which direction it drifts because another important thing in survival is to figure out where the water is flowing to. All right. A lot of times people like to follow the direction of water flow. So if it's not just a little puddle or something, it's a river, then a lot of people like to follow the rivers. But this is about finding north. You use the leaf and the needle and you can find north. Another thing that I think is really cool that I found is if you take a meat tray from the grocery store, you can cut out little round holes and you can place a needle through those holes. Uh, once again, all these photos are on my blog. Uh, you can push a needle through these holes, and then you can put it in the water just like you would with the other one, with the leaf. Um, that's assuming that you have these in your bag because you're a prepper, and preppers have all kinds of crazy stuff in their bug out bag. Um, I know I do. So you put it in the water, and it should turn just like the needle on a leaf, and it will point north. The next one. Another constellation is Orion's Belt. Orion's Belt runs east and west, and the sword hangs down from Orion's Belt, points south. Like I said, everything is round, so the east and west of Orion's Belt is not actually very east and west. You have to make a very strange circular pattern to get it to point correctly to east and west. But the sword that hangs down from Orion's Belt does point fairly close to south. So that's what I would do, is I would look at Orion's belt and then follow the sword to south, not the east and west line of the belt, because I don't find it to be as accurate. The next method is going, you know, just let's, let's assume that you do not know anything about the Big Dipper, you don't know anything about Orion's Belt, you don't know anything about the moon or the sun or any of this. Um, you are pretty much under a rock when it comes to any of the stuff that I've already told you about. 
but you are for some reason some analytical crazy person and you can figure angles out and stuff like that which after this hopefully you should be able to is you can follow the movement of any of the stars if you go and google um if you google like time lapse photos of stars or something like that you're going to see a lot of photos where the stars look like they're in circles they, they make a circle over the night so that's what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to allow the stars to move through the night to point us in the direction we want to go. So how you're going to do this is you're going to put two sticks in the ground, one of them taller than the other one. The first stick, um, just to make it easier on us old people with bad backs, make the first stick about five feet tall, make the second stick about four feet tall. You can use smaller sticks, it's not that big a deal, but just to save your back a little bit, use five and four or six and five it's up to you you will use your eye and line the tops of the five foot and the four foot stick where you see the tip or you see the star touching the tip of both sticks so the set the tall stick should be behind the short stick and you should see the star touching the tip of them from there Wait 15 to 30 minutes. The longer, the better. If you see the star move up, you are looking east. If you see the star move down, you are looking west. And if you see the star move right, you are looking south. If you see it move left, you are looking north. Now, that is, you're going to go back to the sticks, you're going to, Put your eye where the sticks line back up, but the star is no longer going to be touching them. So the star that you were looking at before that were touching the sticks, which direction did it go? Up, down, left, or right? I'm not going to repeat the east, west, south, and north, uh, which direction it travels because it takes a little bit too long. But that is yet another method to find north, east, south, and west. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this um, this portion. I know it can be kind of boring just sitting here talking about ways of finding north. Um, I try to make this as energetic as possible, as um, entertaining as possible. And if you guys have anything that you would like me to start adding to this, that would be great. I would love to make this more entertaining for you guys. If you guys want me to throw some jokes in the middle, if you want me to give you like some historical commentary, uh, it doesn't really matter to me. Whatever would entertain you guys more to make you listen to um, the skills that I'm trying to teach you guys, whatever will make it more fun, that's what I'm willing to do. So just get back with me. You can go to uh, theprepperpodcast.com and uh, I believe I have a tab that says uh, contact me and you can click on that and you can get a hold of me um, pretty soon I will try to get myself a, um, a hotline so that you guys can call in your questions that would be really cool for me to be able to uh, play all of you guys on the air as you see fit and uh, once again I don't need to know everything about you if you don't want me to. And I will not give your full name over the air if you ask a question. Usually I'll go by a first name basis. And if you give me a location, I will probably just say what state you're in. So it would be like Bob from Colorado or Dan from Florida. That's, that's how I would probably do it. All right, uh, next, I had a question from somebody. And that question was, what can you do to assist in training your children? Uh, what he's talking about here is he wants to know if, uh, if there are some ways of uh, teaching your children all the skills that you would want to learn as a prepper or as a survivalist. And uh, he wants to know how to train them that way. Um, well, let me start off first. Um, I'm going to make two blog posts over 
um, the children and teaching the children and stuff like that. Um, so look for that uh, at cleversurvivalist.com. You can uh, see that coming up pretty soon, well, at least within the next week or so. So we want to use games. We want to use games because children love games. So school's not really school if it's a game, right? Training's not really training if it's a game, right? Paintball's not training. Paintball's fun. Airsoft's not training. Airsoft is fun. But they're getting trigger time. They're getting used to uh, a way of... of um, they're getting used to the tactics of it. So, well, game number one. Paintball or airsoft. Get them the gear that they need to be safe. Paintball, airsoft, and join in the fun with them. Let them win on, on occasion. Make it fun for them. That is a very fun game for them. All right, the next game. Geocaching. <laughs> it doesn't seem like much of a game, but they're going to learn how to orienteer. They're going to learn how to use a compass and map, and they're going to learn how to use a GPS. I would start off letting them use a GPS on your cell phone because the GPS on your cell phone is much easier to use. It is less accurate than a handheld GPS, but it is a little easier to use. Next, move them up to your GPS. Once they've gotten the hang of using GPSs and maps and stuff like that, well then now you can teach them how to use a compass and map, and you can put the um, you can put the grid on the map. Okay, so the latitude, longitude, you can put that on the map, uh, and they can learn how to find, um, or you can get a map with it already on there. That's that's what I would do because it's a lot more accurate and a lot more detailed. But they can use the map to find the geocaches. It's really just high track, or high, um, high tech treasure hunting, and you can find more information about that at uh, www.geocaching.com. Next game is what can you fit in your backpack? I actually did a blog post about this a long time ago. My children and I um, have done um, that game, and they would put whatever they could fit in their backpack. I would tell them, we have 72 hours to get out of here. Or we have, sorry. <laughs> we have to get out of here right now. And we're going to be gone for like three days. I want you guys to fit everything in your backpack that you think you're going to need. And I would give them no other information than that. They would go in there and they would grab their clothes. They would grab toys and all kinds of stuff. And it's hilarious to see what kids can bring sometimes. I mean... If nothing else, you guys are going to be entertained with what they put in their backpacks. And then you can, you know, walk through and you can say, well, you know, the reason why you would want to bring this or you wouldn't want to bring this is because of this. You know, so you're teaching them, you're having fun, they're having fun, and make sure that they put up the backpack and they put up the clothes and stuff that they pulled out. Because first time we did it, we didn't even think about that. As obvious as it may seem, we were just you know, having fun and forgot the kids ended up throwing their toys and clothes all over the house. But that's cool. All right. Shooting the can. This is better than target practice because cans are reactive targets. So fill up your can with some triple expanding foam, like great stuff or something like that. And the cans will not fall apart on you very quickly. And they will, when you shoot them, they fall over. It's that simple. The kid shoots it, it falls over. They yell and scream and say, yay. And then they shoot another one. It falls over, they yell, scream, and say, yay. All right, so shooting the can or using any other type of reactive target is much, much better than target practice, especially for the untrained. So start off with BB guns and airsoft guns, work up to pellet rifles, and then up to 22s, stuff like that. However, your, um, however where you are will allow it. The next game is not really a game at all. The next game is going camping, having a camp out. Go with us, you know, and have a, like a little small hike or something like that. Dad needs to learn a valuable skill before the camp out. 
Dad, I'm talking to you. You don't need to go and learn this skill while camping. It will take forever, and you don't want to look like an idiot in front of your kids. So, spend a little bit of time through the week, learn the skill, and when you go camping, you can try it out. But let's think about something. You're trying to make a fire with a bow drill. Just because you made a fire with a bow drill at home under optimum conditions does not mean it's going to happen in the wilderness. So what are you going to do? When it does not work because the everything is damp, you will pull out a lighter and you will light the fire because dad is a survivalist or a prepper and dad has contingency plans. So that's an important thing. Okay? Well, that's going to be the end of the show, um, episode number seven. Once again, you can find the show notes and any links that I decide to throw on there. You can find those at theprepperpodcast.com slash zero zero seven. I hope you guys enjoyed and you figured out how to find North. And I hope that uh, I answered your question on some of the things that you can do to train your kids um, I want to remind you guys, please go to the prepperpodcast.com slash iTunes. It is very important to me and my podcast that you go to iTunes. You give me that five star review that you know that I earned. Uh, I'm serious though, guys. If you don't think that my podcast is worth a five star review, please don't give me a five star review. I want you to be honest. But I also want you to like my podcast. So those that really like my podcast, go give me the five-star review, okay? Um, and then leave a comment because those comments help also. Those reviews and those comments move my podcast up so that more people will see it. If you think that it is important that more people are prepared for disasters and the... Um, economic crisis and stuff like that that all of us are preparing for well then you need to send them number one you need to send them to my podcast but number two you can reach a lot more people if you go and leave these reviews and move my podcast up to number one in its uh, category more people will find it more people will subscribe to it and more people will learn and when they find my podcast guess what I almost always talk about my blog as well. My blog has a lot of posts on it. You know, I show visual things on my blog that I can't do on a podcast. So they're going to learn a lot more if they find my blog as well. So you will be helping me build a business of free content. And you will be helping other people prepare for um, rough times if that happens. And uh, you may or may not know since uh, my episodes are pretty early but we want to focus on family on this podcast all right most people that are prepping are doing it for their families so we're going to focus on family not just on prepping so a lot of the people that are going crazy and ruining their marriage they're going to be able to rein it back a little bit if they um, listen to me a lot. So, you're also helping people's marriages out. So please go to iTunes. Please go to theprepperpodcast.com slash iTunes. It's that easy. Um, well, that's it. You guys have a great week, and I will see you next week at The Prepper Podcast.